Coming up on this week's show, a huge Duke Nukem leak is coming. We say goodbye to an industry legend. We chat to the man who's reinventing the Amiga game scene, Hero. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, pre-orders are live for their latest book, The King of Fighters, The Ultimate History, all-star edition, limited to just 3,000 copies. That version even comes with a slipcase that plays in-game sound effects. Seriously. Officially endorsed by SNK, you can get yours right now and the rest of their retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.com. And with our friends at PCBWay, who offer a fully featured custom PCB prototype service with low-cost, fast turnaround quality boards, and they do features such as 3D printing and injection moulding, and they're massive supporters of the retro community. Get an instant quote right now for your project at PCBWay.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 326. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show. The podcast every week takes you on a journey into the world of retro gaming. Of course, we bring you up to speed on all the happenings, all the big news stories in the world of retro gaming. And we're joined by a special guest each week too. Now, we'll tell you more about our incredible guest who's doing amazing things on the Amiga scene in just a moment. Yeah, but first, um, I I wanted to talk about something quite interesting. Uh, We've got Retro Hammer, who's... uh, discord moderator for us and uh you know there's a few kind of background staff that help us out on the retro hour and he's just moved in to a new house and he's kind of creating a gamer space at the moment and uh it's looking pretty awesome to be honest and i was just thinking like how important is it to have a gamer space and let's just tell our listeners about our own kind of gamer spaces and where we we keep everything uh you know so it doesn't spill out into the house and uh we end up getting in trouble with partners. And oh, stuff mine like does that. spill out into the house massively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've tried to contain it before. Never really works. I think I've got about, well, my wife reckons I've got three gaming rooms. You the have. Now. There's, no, there's no reckoning about it. You have. <laughs> does well, she, I also say like, the living room, I've got 25% of the living room. The rest of it is hers, I'll say. All, all the cushions. And does stuff. she you know, open that, cupboards and then suddenly <laughs> like wires <laughs> fall out and uh, old adapters and joysticks? Yeah, it's trying to get a plate out of the kitchen and like a, a 32X falls on her head. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've converted my spare bedroom into my kind of game zone. Mm. And uh, yeah, but I tried to limit my connection and now it's it's got huge, but nothing compares to yours, does it, Joe? Oh, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I've got, I'm, 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 I've so, I'm in a unique position. When we bought our house, you know, five, six years ago, we were looking at like half a rather home, if you will, or at least we we're going to stay here for a while. And uh, our spare room is, is pretty big. And obviously over the last kind of two years, and thank you to our listeners and Patreon and stuff like that, I've been able to kind of turn my games room into a studio, essentially. Um, But it's kind of multifunctioning. So I do my normal kind of Monday to Friday, nine till five in here. So I've got like a desk in the corner of my room with like two computers set up. So one for the retro hour with like my mic on its arm and, you know, I've got my, my, you know, my mixing desk and everything. But then I also have like my computer for my normal work, which is just a laptop. But then it's like, when I go on Teams meetings, you know, or some people who have joined us on the Patreon Hangout, like, I'm just surrounded by, like, shelves of Mega Drive <laughs> games, which are kind of, like, littering the walls. But I have run out of room, um, and I and I now have, like, a mountain of, of Wii and Mega Drive games, which have not got any home, like, stuck on a shelf on a bookcase behind me. But, um, yeah, mine, mine is kind of leaking out into the main house. And we've got, like, a, a really old-fashioned side carport on the side of our house which has got like an outhouse in it from because it's an ex-council house you know from like 50 years ago before toilets were inside in the uk and uh the plan is is to turn that into like a into a living area you know rip all that out and turn it to an office but it's just a case of doing it so then well, my daughter i think you should keep the room. toilet in there and yeah like you know copies of rise of the robots <laughs> yeah that's a good there. idea like maybe i should do that like on video who's like <laughs> oh, should we flush it? gaming toilet yeah a jaguar cd on the top oh um, yeah <laughs> don't you dare oh yeah so yeah that's that's mine at the moment but i just want to funny enough you said about the spilling out shout out to one of my best friends shout out to uh to jason days of thunder gaming on instagram he is going for a full mega drive collection and he lives in a little bungalow with his family to a point where he, when I go over to his house to show him, to show him his latest releases, we literally went into his daughter's room and opened up one of her wardrobe doors and he started pulling games out 
And then we went into <laughs> we went into the kitchen. And you know, like in the kitchen when you have that drawer full of crap. He went in there and it was full of Mega Drive games. And I was like, how are you not divorced yet? Like, like his house is spilling with Mega Drive games. It's insane. Like, it's it, if my insane. wife ever complains again, I'm going to tell her about it. I know. It, it, and it then, would and be then awesome. He, and then uh... the, the audacity, he asked me if he could store his games at my house because he was in so much trouble. <laughs> and, I, and I said no. And I told my wife about it. And she went, you answered correctly. <laughs> 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 well, it'd be awesome to see uh, you, your like listeners, um, kind of setups, and also the oh, weirdest yeah. kind of unusual place that you guys are storing video games in as well. That would be good to see. So, if you could just uh, tweet us, uh, that would be awesome, and we'll we'll retweet them, no doubt. Yeah, at Retro Hour UK. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can get us on Facebook and Insta as well. I mean, I've got my Amiga twelve hundred setup next to me, which I play a lot, mainly thanks to. Let's link it into this week's guest because uh, E-Rock, he's been doing some incredible things on the Amiga scene. Many other people have as well, but also he's behind um, this engine that we've been talking about quite a bit on the podcast over the last few months, the Scorpion engine. So with our guest this week, we're going to kind of find out the background on this. Um, I think it's fair to say this engine that is really reinvigorating mm. and reinventing the Amiga game scene. There, there was always like a limit with games engines and stuff for the Amiga. So like Amos and... Blitz Basic. Um, there was also a. I remember one called Backbone as well, and uh, there's mm. a new one called Red Pill. And like Backbone had a few limitations. I remember people were starting to do like Sonic versions in there, and they were kind of cool for their time. But um, the Scorpion engine is a real modern version, and uh, you know it, it just enables people, even without the skills of creating games, to be able to create them. And we're seeing like an absolute waterfall of games that are arriving on the Amiga at the moment. And, you know, they get a decent frame rate on a really low spec Amiga, which is really amazing. And uh, Eric's first machine was a CD32 as well. So this this whole thing wow. is just a fantastic uh, interview. Well, it wasn't even a CD32 back in the day. He only got into the Amiga scene around 10 years ago, didn't he? Yeah. So and quite unusual compared to most of our guests. And he also kind of started by tweaking CD32 games and, you know, mm. creating releases and these kind of multiple disc releases where you had like a disc with tons of games on them and stuff. And uh, it's actually driven him to go into development. And the Scorpion engine looks like it might be... a in the future, hitting, you know, other platforms as well. So it's not just limited to the Amiga. It will be throughout the uh, 68K world, which is amazing. Well, you mentioned he does these um, special editions of Amiga games as well that are really like um, hacks or mods, aren't they, of old games that he thinks could have been made better? Yeah. Like he did a version of Street Fighter that he made a lot better. A lot and, were rushed uh, the- uh, for the CD32, weren't they? <laughs> they were just literally slapped on CD, you know. Well, the only guy that I know, actually, we talked about Rise of the Robots, he actually improved Rise of the Robots, oh, wow. as much as you can with that game. So. <laughs> I was going to say, is there well, he, uh, much you could do with it? <laughs> Did he bring Brian May in? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hear all about that and lots more as well, the story of the Scorpion engine and how it's doing its bit to kind of reinvigorate the Amiga gaming scene with our special guest, Eric Hogan, a.k.a. e is coming up on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, lots of news stories to get into this week while we're talking about the Amiga gaming scene and also a company that, you know, we're not only big on the Amiga, but the consoles and the 8-bit machines as well, Ocean Software. Very sad to read that a bit earlier on this week, one of the founders of Ocean Software, David Ward, sadly passed away. And to me, I mean, you know, it does feel quite sad in a way because, I mean, we're hearing more of these stories, aren't we, as time goes on, as kind of these people who were pioneers of the video games industry back in the 70s and 80s are obviously, you know, sadly getting older. We are hearing a lot more of these stories lately, but I think this one kind of hit me quite hard because I've got so many memories of, you know, Ocean Software. They were, you know, I mean, it's talking about the British gaming scene. Mm. They were really one of the most influential companies ever that really kickstarted the industry in this country. Yeah, oh, yeah and uh, the kind of whole 8-bit era as well. They were huge on the uh, Spectrum and uh, C64 and uh, you know, that, that whole Ocean logo, just kind of seeing that always screamed quality to me. and uh, it, it, it always screamed the good licensed games to me. Yeah. For like Nintendo and Sega and stuff, you know, that late 80s, early 90s, like, you know, Robocop games like that, you know, <laughs> Waterworld for some reason has come into mind. But, you know, I always just remember them being behind the decent 
licensed games. So, you know, like you say, massive pioneers in the industry. Yeah, and I think they were, obviously, they became known for that, didn't they? Mm. Um, originally, if you go back to the 80s, it was stuff like, you know, Platoon, Top Gun, mm. Daily Thompson's Decathlon was a really, really big game of theirs as well. But then it went into like the late 80s, early 90s. I remember playing stuff like, you know, The Addams Family, yeah. um, you know, that was kind of a, uh, a Mario Brothers kind of yeah, rip yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and stuff like Batman. I mean, God, Batman was one of the, you know, the Batman pack. That's what most of my friends who got into Amigas had. You yeah. know, that was, I think the first Amiga game I ever played was Batman the movie, around a friend's house. And they even um, had a connection with, like, US Gold. That's how they were getting, you know, a lot of these titles. And I remember the, the Hit Squad, um, which were the kind of budget titles and compilations that you would get, which actually kind of made it accessible to a lot of people that wouldn't be able to get these titles usually, yeah. And it made it a kind of pocket money decision to to be able to buy a title. So it wasn't just the high end stuff as well. They they also had the the budget stuff there. And am I right in thinking Ocean were the uh, company with all the crazy cars and all the the flashy stuff going on later on? You might be thinking of Imagine Software originally, but <laughs> Imagine, Ocean did, yes. did actually acquire them when they went bankrupt. So they did become part of Ocean. Um, and actually, you know, if you want to see a bit about David Ward, you know, that documentary that kind of focuses on Imagine that we've you know talked about loads of times on the podcast um, on YouTube called Commercial Breaks. David Ward actually features quite heavily in that as well. You know, the making of games like Hunchback. And there's also quite an interesting bit where he goes to um, a market stall and tries to find some pirated games on cassette. <laughs> and he comes across a few as well. So it's a really interesting look. And not only, you know, how big Ocean were in that era, but, you know, the early days of the UK gaming scene as well. So definitely a true pioneer who was there from, you know, day one pretty much. So he will be sadly missed. And, you know, as a lot of people have got in touch with us with this news, it just makes you realise more and more how important, you know, the, these interviews are that we do with people to record these stories. I mean, sadly, we never got David Ward on the show, but I think it does prove that there's definitely a really important reason for documenting these stories while, you know, we're all still around, I guess. Totally. Like, looking at the amount of games that he's produced... Uh... It's just absolutely insane, you know. You've got stuff like Narc there, Robocop. You've got like, uh, oh, just Total Recall. Toki, one of your, one of your favourites there. Uh, yeah, Navy Seals, like Lost Patrol, you know. There's so much there that's just absolutely classic. And I, I think you're right. This is why we do the podcast, to kind of yeah. get these voices. And, and, and so, you know, throughout history, people will be able to listen in the future and go, oh, yeah, uh, this is what it was like. And, you know, hear people's story to kind of getting into these companies and uh, becoming producers. So uh, rest in peace, David. Yeah, thank you for all the memories. Now, there is a, another new Mega Drive game that's been announced, and it feels like the Mega Drive scene is quite active these days. I mean, over the last five years, it feels like there's more and more titles coming out on it. And these are not always, you know, kind of reissues of old games. There are actually new games being made for the Mega Drive. And uh, this one, you don't see many horror games on the Mega Drive, but this one looks pretty cool. This is called Sacred Line 2. Yeah, this looks pretty creepy. This does. So this is um, Sasha Darko's Sacred Line 2, which is the, se- the sequel to Sacred Line, um, which is... I don't know about you guys. That makes sense. It makes make sense. <laughs> a game that's not been on my radar. I've not heard of this at all until this release. And it's, it's essentially, it's it's being produced by Mega Cat Studios, and we're going to see a physical release of it later in the year. Um, but there's already a demo out for it on the website for people to check out, you know, on ROM format. And you can, you know, start getting your orders in already. And when the ROM is ready, you will get the ROM before you get the cartridge, which is pretty cool. Um, but it's essentially a puzzle point and click kind of adventure game in the vein of that early 90s it, it looks very i don't know if you guys can see it but it really reminds me of kind of like um it's hard to describe but like the early full motion you know okay kind of full so, motion so video what games, it is, it is, is full motion video we, we had a lot of pd games like this on the amiga and stuff yeah and what it is is it's it's 3d rendered scenes yes but they're yeah. probably static with yeah. like a kind of dungeon crawler aspect or a, or a kind of text adventure you know look left go to the gate go to this area so mm. it's kind of a bit like a text adventure but with added added kind of uh imagery if yeah. if you get you what it I reminds mean. me of it reminds me of mist a bit yes thank you i'm glad you guys jumped in mist and raven yeah yeah, yeah it does it, it reminds me of them as well and you know or corpse killer if you ever played that <laughs> yeah TV, yeah yeah that, was a- that kind of kind of vein and it looks good it looks nice for the mega drive and 
It looks quite eerie, um, but essentially, from what I can gather, it's set. Um, you play as a girl called Sarah who's got a troubled past, and she was kidnapped by a religious cult called the the Set Namjira. Um, and it's set in Yugoslavia in 1999 in an alternate world where Yugoslavia still exists. So it looks quite, how do I describe this? Like it looks quite Eastern desolate. Block or, yeah, Eastern yeah. Bloc and stuff like, um, and it looks pretty creepy and it, you know, kind of to do with like, you know, satanic cults and stuff like that. But there's a lot of puzzles in it. You know, you have to play chess and stuff like that. It looks pretty cool. There's no kind of like set release date other than late 2022 um, for your physical version. But it, it it does look nice and like, you know, I like the box of it. It's got a very Japanese style uh, Mega Drive slash Genesis, you know, cartridge and box, which re- looks really cool. And it, it there's varying prices, you know, from like $20, but all the way up to $500. Um, and what makes me laugh, well, not makes me laugh, which I think I guess is kind of cool is if you pledge the $500, you actually get to make your own story within the game, your mm. own personal DLC cartridge for the game where the developer of the game will kind of make your own, you know, your own story and stuff like that, you know, which you kind of get to come up with and stuff, which I think is pretty cool. It's pretty unique. Not something I think I'd be forking out to, but, you know, I do keep seeing these games coming out on the Mega Drive and I love collecting for the Mega Drive and I'm like, I really should just pull the trigger like $25 and get it. Do you know what I mean? I like the way that they've done it because it's it's kind of like, right, the Mega Drive's not going to be, you know, if this was on the... Mega CD or Sega yeah. CD, it would look a, a lot different. This would be all full motion renders. Yeah. But, you know, having these pictures are good and seeing the kind of DLC that they've done as well, it's like, uh, you know, like polarized pictures as well, mm. um, where it's kind of black and white or it's in the negatives and stuff. And it just has that nice kind of aesthetic and uh, it, it's something completely different to a lot of the titles that you do get on the yeah. Mega Drive where it's all pixely or it's kind of hand drawn this is very rendered and very kind of uh 90s as well i love that dlc where you can get your own story yeah as well i think that is a really cool idea i mean it kind of goes into a bit more detail on their website you know what you can have like you said for example you could be the hero in your story um and he'll put you in the the belgrade ruins mm-hmm. and he said you know you could pick like you know if you don't like your boss at work he could be the end of game boss in this that you have to defeat <laughs> <laughs> he said you know he could have members in your family there as well yeah um, so you know, it, it depends kind of what you want. He'll make a story around it. I was thinking how cool it would be if it was like, you know, a, a retro hour. That's a theme version of that's, this. Word. That's defeat not a bad Dan idea. Wood. you got to defeat Dan Wood. <laughs> well, I'm thinking Joe's on the hunt for games. You know, Ravi's got the games. Joe's chasing him. Yeah, maybe. You know, you, he's them, your, your wife's behind you with a rolling. Dan's board. trying to intercept. <laughs> Dan's, Dan's the mediator. Um, but, you know, joke, jokes aside as well, um, they are doing if you donate $100 to the Ukraine Red Cross. Obviously, there's a lot yeah. of stuff going on there at the moment. Um, if you donate $100 to them and send them your receipt, they'll send you a ROM of the game. Awesome. Um, right. Which is also awesome. You know what they're doing on the website, you know. Um, so, you know, which is nice, I guess, obviously, with the game being kind of set around that area and stuff, you know, acknowledging what's happening and stuff. But it just looking at the pictures, it's got a creepy vibe. And you don't get many horror right. games, like you say, on the Mega Drive. So looks very cool. Yeah, and there is a free demo that you can download as well. You know, if you want to try it out on a, an EverDrive or an emulator, um, that is available for free to download, about a 15-minute demo. So I'll put that in our show notes and all the other stories as well. You find them every week at theretrohour.com. Now, I didn't think we'd see any updates about Duke Nukem Forever. <laughs> now, this is obviously one of the most infamous games in gaming history, isn't it? That was uh, got dragged out for almost, what, 15 years? That game was in development hell. Yeah. And I know that we've done 14 years and 44 days. (laughs) Yeah. It was just one of those where, I mean, we've done entire episodes about Duke Nukem Forever before. I mean, check our back catalogue. We've definitely had a few guests on that were involved in that game, if you want to hear the story of it. Uh, But obviously, I mean, it was started back in the... Late nineties, wasn't uh, it? Ninety six, yeah, and it and it kind yeah. of ended in uh, twenty ten. <laughs> yeah, with uh, a game that really didn't get received very well when it eventually did make it onto the market. I mean, I played it through on the PlayStation Three, thought it was very average, but I think, like anything, if people have been waiting almost fifteen years for it, you're probably only going to disappoint after that long. But it turns out, I mean, the one version of Duke Nukem Forever that you know, I think. From my memory, all the interviews we've done, I've got a feeling that project was kind of abandoned okay, so, and restarted. So, so about what five happened times. was um, every time they wanted to create a new engine, 
uh, or, or a new engine came up that they decided to switch with because technology was advancing over those 14 years. So they originally started with a Quake 2 engine and uh, they were kind of running it within that. And then they scrapped the entire project and redid it from scratch using the Unreal Engine. Now, the thing we're just about to talk to uh, talk about was from the Unreal Engine, which was in 2001 at E3. And, uh, you know, this was before the year before it had got a Vaporware of the Year award. You know, it's it's like this game was so highly anticipated because Duke Nukem was such a big character and it was so kind of popular. But, you know, if you keep changing the the, the technology and you keep changing engine and you're playing catch up, then, you know, you're never going to win. And I think that was the case here that they were constantly playing catch up. And uh, that E3 2001 demo is, uh, is, is pretty infamous uh, because that was straight away on the uh, brand new then unreal engine. Yeah. And I remember a lot of people, you know, whenever you read about kind of the history of Duke Nukem forever, that 2001 demo a lot of people kind of talk about as kind of, you know, the holy grail, the version that they actually wanted because mm. it looked the best. Well, it turns out now that apparently it won't be long until we actually get to play that 2001 E3 build of Duke Nukem Forever. Now, when I first heard this story, um, it got leaked onto 4chan by a guy called Exor, and he uploaded some pictures and videos of the gameplay of it. Now, obviously, you know, 4chan... A lot of trolls hang out there. You know, a lot of people thought, okay, you know, someone's got to the effort of making a convincing fake here. But actually, um, one of the developers, um, George Brussard, who was the lead project manager for um, Duke Nukem Forever, he actually confirmed on Twitter, he said, um, the leak is real. And he said he doesn't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's a very painful history. He said, uh, don't get your hopes up, though, because there's not really a game to play, just a smattering of barely populated test levels. And he's got no idea who leaked this. But I've got to say, I mean, looking at the the videos in here as well, and from the guy that leaked this XOR, he actually reckons there's actually quite a lot to play here. I was going to say, when he said it's <laughs> deserted levels, it looks quite full. Like, I'm I'm mm. I'm watching the videos of it, and I'm like, yo, I wish I got this rather than Well, well what after we got. that <laughs> one, like- <laughs> after that E3 2001, in 2006, Brashad told journalists the team had effed up and uh, ended up restarting the whole development after that as well. So I don't think he's the biggest fan of this build. Yeah, I think it was five times they restarted it from memory. So, I mean, you know, completely did away with everything and started all over again. But, yeah, I mean, the gameplay in this, I think, looks pretty solid, actually. I have, mean, have you played the, you, Joe, I, have I, you played the final version? Like, I have not played it, yeah, yeah. so I yeah, can't compare Dan, it. To, it. You've completed you know. it. Wow. Uh, how <laughs> does it compare to, to um, the kind of... Duke Nukem Forever final version. Oh, this version here, the leak. No, it isn't out yet. This leak comes out in um, next month. Apparently, it's going to be released. But yeah, I, I played the version that came out in 2011. You know, the, yeah, the yeah. Just looking at it, how does it kind of compare to that? Does it look similar, or is it just? Oh, they look nothing no. like. They look no, no. This, this totally different. This leak looks like a game from 2001, like a but a, a really good game from like 2000 kind of looks time splittery doesn't it it you know, does yeah. it, it, and and it's interesting because of this looks kind of time splitter kind of one you know like kind of reminds me of that which was around 2001 but then funny enough duke nukem forever the actual final version of it we got in 2011 reminded me of a really bad version of time splitters future perfect in, interestingly like mm. you know they were kind of trying to like capture that but it was 2011 and future perfect was like 2005 so it just felt about six or seven years too late, whereas this 2001 build looks perfect for the time, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, quite cutting edge for 2001, yeah. I think, yeah. gra- graphically. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, and it's fast, isn't it? It's fast pace. you mm. know, switch between weapons, blowing people away with MP5s and pump-action shotguns. It looks good. You know, if this was released on Steam or, you know, Xbox Now or something like that, I'd, I'd be tempted to pick this up, you know, for like 10, 15 quid and you know, play through it kind of thing, keep me occupied for a couple of nights. It does look really good, but it's just interesting to say that he was like, oh, it's, it, it, you know, on populated levels, but there's enemies in here, you know, there's there's people shooting at you and stuff. So I'd be interested to see when it fully gets leaked, you know, how full it actually is. And I guess uh, so if it is a real engine as well, someone's going to fill it up, aren't they? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. gonna, that was exactly yeah. what I was just about to say. I was like, you know, Duke Nukem's always had a big kind of modding scene, hasn't it? So if this gets out there, you know, which 
this guy that's um, leaked it, he said he's going to put it out to everyone next month in June. And I'm imagining pretty quick, Duke Nukem fans are going to flesh this out into a full game, undoubtedly, won't they? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it could be the Duke Nukem Forever that we always dreamed of. Um, Admittedly, what, 21 years after we thought we were going to get it? They need to put um... every version out there now. (laughs) A compilation disc where you get them all. Where you get all five versions on one disc. (laughs) Duke Nukem Forever's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would kind of be some nice redemption for it, though. You know, after that terrible version came out in 2011, to finally get a good playable version that you know the fans always dreamed of getting. I think that would so. Be cool. uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that and uh, let you know when it surfaces. Of course, you can read more about that and check out those uh, videos in our show notes at theretrohour.com. And that is also the same place if you'd like to help us out with this podcast as well. Because, you know, we've done, God, nearly, what, 330 episodes of this show will be coming up on soon. Never missed a week of it, have we? We have guests, you know, every single week. We work our little socks off on this podcast. Yeah, try we, to. We, we fought through the pandemic. <laughs> we, uh, we managed to keep it going, you know, uh, and and that's thanks to Patreon. You know, now we've got these uh, remote studios where we can do it and it's, really helped, you know, make our time a lot more flexible and we can do interviews at all the odd hours and stuff. And uh, this is all thanks to you guys. And, you know, backing us on Patreon helps us kind of stay independent as well because it is just three of us kind of pumping these out. And uh, it's it's really good fun. And I just love having kind of backers and a, a, a community and, uh, you know, a bit of a kind of feel around it. It, it doesn't feel like we're on isolation kind of just doing this by ourselves yeah i mean we do um a lot for our patrons as well you know we'd love to get you involved in our monthly patrons hangouts that we do you know this is where on a sunday night we all just crack open a drink don't we and we just i I think it's fair to say it's like a you know a virtual pub meeting isn't it where we all just completely geek out about anything retro anything gaming related and more. I, I do see it as like if we were all sat in the pub and somebody just puts a carry bag of all the games they've bought at the most recent car boot or <laughs> yeah. the most recent game shop or something, you know, it, it is really nice to show it off and stuff. And, you know, just reflecting on what Ravi said, you know, being able to do this from our own homes, you know, it has been a godsend having the fans who have funded it because of, you know, even last week, you guys did two back to back episodes, you know, this this week's guest and last week's guest, you guys recorded it at like midnight, didn't you? Yeah. Which yeah, we yeah. would have never been able to do when we were in the studio, you know, because time, the time in the studio was so limited. Um, and we've got such funny stu- stories about when we used to do it at Dan's work and we got kicked out by the band the Saturdays once. And, you know, there was a, a bit, there, and, and that's a true story, isn't it? And yeah, yeah, there, was yeah. a, there, was a, there was a worry that we weren't going to get an episode out that week. And, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, the pandemic did so many things to the Retro Hour, but ultimately, thank you to the people who help us. I feel like we've come out, it's, we've come out of it stronger and better. And we just want to keep that yeah. going. Yeah, it saved the show. It really mm-hmm. did. And, uh, you know, you help us out with the running of it and everything. We couldn't do it without you, seriously. So if you'd like to join our community of Retro Hour super fans and uh, keep the show coming out every week. And also, you get the normal episode early most weeks. You get it ad-free. You get extra content in there. I mean, we do about, God, an extra 15 minutes of news stories for our patrons pretty much every week. Um, and also, you get an extra podcast that we do just for our patrons, if you're a gold member or above, the Retro Hour After Hours, where uh, in the latest episode, um, we're talking about the year 2000 five that was a really interesting chat kind of that dawn of the you know the wii uh the xbox 360 and the playstation 3 really interesting time in gaming so not only do you get all that stuff as well come to the monthly hangouts there'll be one of those coming up in the next couple of weeks and have the pleasure of knowing that it's thanks to you that this podcast continues to come out each and every week and of course you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming hall of fame the Retro Hour Hall of Fame and a massive thank you this week to our latest supporters. Thank you to Jeff Bell, Sebastian Kiernan, Dwayne Risley, and Getting Worse, who all backed us on Patreon. We really appreciate your support. And if you'd like to join them and get your name read out over Ravi singing and this epic music, all you've got to do is back us on Patreon. All the details are at theretrohour.com. Now, let's talk about this, the uh, RAD 2X HDMI retro console cable. Now, they're talking about this as being the only HDMI cable that you'll need to hook your retro consoles up to your modern telly. Come on, guys, sell it to me because if I'm still here with, like, my what's it called my av cables and stuff on my mega God, drive Joe, you know I'm, to... i am i'm far from the hd world when it comes to retro right games. we need to get you into the into the world <laughs> of retro tink so this is a awesome little device i've seen them before with scott 
And this is uh, by RetroTink, this one is, isn't it? So this is powered by the RetroTink, but it's, okay. it's, it's kind of like a, a combination of retro gaming cables and RetroTink. So the way that the RetroTink usually works is it's like an upscaler, mm-hmm. really low latency. Um, you plug it in for your SCART or, or some kind mm-hmm. of external one. This is very different. This is a, a digital cable converter. It's got a line doubler as well and a smoothing filter on top of okay. that. But this works specifically going f- through the back of like certain consoles. So, so it works on the Genesis. So like the drive. Genesis, yeah, yeah uh, the N64, the Saturn, there's a, Saturn. There's a whole list of them, and yeah. the actual output of this is higher quality than the SCART one previously. Mm. So um, this is specifically designed for that. But also, you can get the cables and kind of interchange it. So it's just in this one cable. It doesn't require any power as well. It's just a really smart little kind of device. And uh, I just think it's a, a nice solution compared to getting the kind of uh, SCART solution. You know, this is just, mm. if you really want your Mega Drive to look beautiful, this would be mm. probably one of the best ways of doing it. It's, it's basically converting RGB internally uh, to YPBP. Oh, which is a, a, a format um, that, that presents it really nicely. Okay. And uh, yeah, you can also do NTSC and PAL. Um, it's got the four by three ratio. It does audio as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just a really nice idea having this kind of little cable built in. And it means you haven't got this box on the back or anything. You've, you've just got this nice, sweet little cable when you're coming out in much, much better quality. You know, the box it plugs into, you've actually kind of answered my question there, because I know they do different versions here. Um, obviously, the Nintendo ones, I mean, N64, Super Nintendo, they all had the same port, didn't they? Yeah. Those, so I guess, you know, that would work on any of those. But, you know, if, you, if you've got it on your Mega Drive or your Saturn, for example, I guess you don't need a new box. You just get a new cable that plugs yeah, into it. Yeah, that's my then. assumption. Um, yeah. You know, and it's like £53.99 each for the box yeah which is pretty decent to be fair for like a you know an upscaler and a yeah it's got some kind of, of them hdmi up pounds aren't they yeah exactly and uh hopefully you'd be able to kind of swap them and use them on multiple systems it's it's good to see this kind of thing so i mean the obviously been solutions to do this and remember you, you got a frame meister didn't you got oh, about God, yeah. and that was and about like, 300 quid or something yeah. insane and i had to get it from japan put the firmware on so it is English and then stick an overlay on the remote that had English stuff. So that was that was in the early days and it was a lot more complex than this. And that's the thing. I mean, as newer TVs come out, I mean, I have a my current TV for about three years, my one in my living room, you know, my 60-inch LCD. And that, that hasn't got any SCART connectors. It hasn't even got composite or anything on it, literally just HDMI. Um, so finding a SCART connector on a modern TV is difficult now. And again, you know, you want to run it at the at the display's native resolution as well, which this yeah. thing's going to do. And it's always been a concern of mine because I've tried some of the cheaper ones before, and then the problem is you always get a bit of lag or the latency is too much, and you can you can notice it when you're playing games. Suddenly, you know, I'm not the best games player in the world anyway, but suddenly I'm playing a game, and I'm like, I don't remember being this crap at it. And then you realise it's because it's got about like three seconds of uh, latency or something like that on it. But they're actually saying this one, they've measured it at 53 microseconds. Yeah. And there's a review of it on Nintendo Life, and they're saying that there's no noticeable input lag from their testing. It's, of it, it's so. pretty awesome because you know there are. I, I've like been trying to get one for my PlayStation and stuff. I've been looking around, and I've like there's it's an absolute nightmare of kind of which cables are the best. And you know you get a lot of knockoffs, and you get a lot of kind of even the high end ones. You get rip offs of those online and stuff. So this seems really good, and the fact that it's by RetroTink, you know they're like a, a proper reputable brand and i was going to get the retro tink scart one and anyway for my cd32 but now i'm thinking oh 53 quid you know i could have this on my playstation original have it on my ps2 yeah just need a few cables and you can just uh, swap it out i imagine but i mean you know you'll uh you'll prize my crt out of my cold dead hands you know, <laughs> I mean, crt for life but uh, buried in one <laughs> if i ever do need a solution to uh, hook it up to my modern tv i think this definitely looks like one of the best ones i've seen especially the price i mean they're uh, 53.99 uh, can't go wrong with that, so um, that should be available very soon by the looks of it. 
Now, what about speaking of CRTs? Um, I love this article here. And this actually solves an age-old solution of playing split-screen games. And, you know, your friend or your brother could always see what you were doing. You know, you remember playing N64 GoldenEye? God, I remember playing at your house over Christmas, Joe. Most of the time when I'm playing that with you, my eyes are glued to your section of the screen to <laughs> kind of see where you are. Me running up behind now, you with the PP7 and the DD44. <laughs> yeah, here he comes, <laughs> waiting for you. But now a museum has actually rigged up a multi-screen N64 GoldenEye rig that prevents what they're calling screen cheating. Yeah, so it's not quite as uh, easy as we would hope, but it's very interesting to say the least. So this comes from the Centre for Computing History in Cambridge. And um, it's to actually celebrate the 25-year anniversary of GoldenEye, you know, for the N64, which makes me feel so old, but also awesome that it's been 25 years. And it is essentially, like you say, GoldenEye on four players set up on four separate CRTs to prevent screen cheating. Even though the CRTs are all set up right next to each other, you could just look at them. It is just like playing it on a huge, you know, 52-inch, 55-inch screen these days. But how they have achieved this feels so overcomplicated but also necessary so they've actually to achieve this they've used a device called a c27210 video scaler which is essentially a piece of equipment which they used to use in live broadcasting yeah it's it's, it's like a kind of video switcher yes what it does is it separates out the um the section so it will zoom in on usually on you have four of them on a screen it would zoom in on that corner, scale yeah. that up, and then yeah. chuck it out as an output. And imagine these were used in like, you know, when you used to watch TV as a kid and a film or a TV show where you would suddenly see the uh, the, pro- the broadcast room and they'd have like 30 CRTs all like stacked up against each other. Like a video wall. Yeah, which they're all looking at yeah. and stuff. It essentially was used for them. Or, and- or, in, a, or in a club. I, I do or, remember yeah, going, the- um, yeah. oh God, going to the Trocadero Sega world. And they yeah. had this huge video CRT wall, and it was like Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that, I remember that must take like up a lot of like power. M- MTV yeah. like adverts and stuff. They had yeah, it as yeah. well. And essentially, they're using one of them, and they've got each TV tuned in for the frequency to this device. And then, like Ravi says, it zoom. They've then programmed it to zoom in onto each section of the split screen. So essentially, each screen. It, each one of the four CRTs is displaying the entire four split screen, but it's zoomed in on each corner mm. of the digital screen. You know, what's kind of happening in the, the, the digitalness of it, which is really, really interesting. It just makes me laugh because they've then got the TV set up all next to each other in a row. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I'm sure when the event actually runs, they might separate them. But it is kind of like a childhood dream, that is, you know, to have it on each TV. So, you know, it, I, it just... It just seems so over the top to have one of these devices. It looks like they've actually got it running through two to get it to work. So maybe yeah, one for I, <laughs> the frequency and then one for the zooming in. It's it's um it's interesting because the quality will be lost. So yeah. it will be lower quality, but then it would still yeah. probably look decent because they've put it on some like PVM CRTs. Yeah. You and, know? and it upscales it as well, apparently. Oh, so, okay. You know, so it, so it kind of upscales it a bit. Yeah. Are, I. What what are your memories of like video walls? Like I remember my friend, he got one, uh, and he put it in a nightclub, and this was quite recently, uh, like an art event, and people were trying to go up and touch it because you know you get the static on the front and stuff, and this thing got hot. Like this thing was majorly hot. You could like fry some barbecue on there, and it was like, don't go and touch that. <laughs> we had to like rope it off. I think. I always remember seeing them at like I think you know. Top Shop in London had a big one back in the early 2000s. I remember looking at it being like, you know, how they've got different things on each screen. Because mm. you get like a big image that was made up on the video wall. But obviously, this article kind of explains how they did it using these devices, I guess. So, yeah, it's quite interesting imagine, to see that. But, um, imagine one for sale now and then just buying it and parting them all out. Oh, my yeah. God. That would that would be like a That's retro That's going to be Ravi's next thing, that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to buy a around, CRT wall, wall and then every room in my house will be full of old, old CRTs. Yeah, so if you want to uh, visit that, it's going to be at the uh, the N64 GoldenEye 25th at Celebrations at the uh, Centre for Computing History in Cambridge. 
Now, before we get into our special guest talking to someone who's doing his bit to reinvigorate and reinvent the Amiga game scene, the wonderful E-Rock is coming up in just a moment. Let's give a massive thank you to this week's sponsor and a very dear friend of the Retro Hour who've supported us for many years. This is our friends at Future Publishing. Now, of course, they publish the wonderful Retro Gamer magazine that, you know, if you love what we talk about, you need to be reading Retro Gamer every month as well. But also they do lots more gaming mags, including Play, Edge, PC Gamer, and we've got an incredible offer on for you right now where you can save up to 95% and get three issues of your favourite future gaming magazine for just one pound. So I'll tell you how to claim that in just a minute. And uh, they've got some incredible things on their Gamers Mags this month, including, if you have a look at the latest edition of uh, PC Gamer Magazine, they're talking about Nightingale. Yeah, this looks really cool. This is a uh, world exclusive um, on the new game Nightingale, which comes from the ex-Bioware developers, you know, the guys who are behind like Bioshock and stuff, which really looks cool. Mm. And also... Um, they've got a whole article in there, which I really need to read, uh, all about Elden Ring, the must-have mods, and also how to play the game on easy mode. Um, so something which is right up my street, and also um, a buyer's guide on uh, latest graphics cards, which looks really interesting. And of course, Future Publishing bring you the uh, legendary Edge magazine. Uh, yeah, Edge. I, I really like Edge because it's kind of looking at all the modern stuff, but also there's a bit of kind of retro stuff in there occasionally. They're looking at the uh, new game, which is The Invincible by uh, the creators of Alien Isolation and Firewatch. Also, they're, they're talking about uh, .mu and uh, kind of the secrets of making old games feel new. And there's just some awesome stuff in this uh, magazine, so definitely check it out. You know, speaking of how retro is getting into everything as well in the uh, latest edition of uh, Play magazine, latest issue there, not only are they are talking about the Elder Scrolls online, but also there's a big feature about the PlayStation 5 going retro in there as well. And of course, Future Publishing bring you Retro Gamer magazine each month. Uh, this month, the cover feature is all about celebrating 40 years of the spectrum, and they give you a year-by-year account of Sir Clive Sinclair's spectacular 8-bit home computer. So you can get three issues of any of those magazines for just £1 with this special Retro Hour offer. Use our special link so they know that we sent you magazinesdirect.com slash retro hour and save a massive 95% on the cover price of Retro Gamer, Edge, Play or PC Gamer by going to magazinesdirect.com slash retro hour and a big thank you to our friends at Future Publishing for their continued support. No, I don't know how they do that for a pound. That's insane. <laughs> Right then, time to get some inside stories about reinventing the Amiga game scene with our special guest. E-Rock is next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for the main event then when we welcome on our very special guest this week. And I've got to say, our guest this week has actually um, reinvigorated my interest in the Amiga CD32 with some incredible collections and games that he's made for that recently, which uh, we'll get into all that and lots more as well. But let's welcome on our special guest this week, Eric Hogan, aka E-Rock. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. Um, and it's good to be here. Yeah, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And, uh, you know, we're massive fans of the Amiga, so it's uh, always nice to uh, get a chance to geek out about the Amiga with uh, a like-minded person. Yep, thank you very much. Well, I mean, let's go back to, because I know you've got quite an interesting history with the Amiga that probably differs quite a bit to um, a lot of Amiga people that we get on the show. Kind of going back to your early computer and gaming experience. And I mean, as a kid, do you remember what initially first got you into gaming then and kind of what was the first gaming experience and computer that you had well when i was about um two years old my family got their first computer which was a uh, commodore 64 we had a few of the classics uh we had commando we had um pit stop 2 and yeah i, I guess just i somehow always knew that i wanted to make games like even even when i was really young even when i was a bit about that age, I was thinking, well, these games are cool, but I'd really love to be able to make um, my own game. So I'd sort of daydream about different ideas for um, uh, for games, for games where you fly helicopters like Gunship or games where you uh, – with different platform games. Did you kind of understand how the code worked or did you have like a, a basic idea and were you like prodding around and uh, changing files and stuff like that? I didn't have any clue at all. I didn't actually start developing any games until, I guess, my early teens, um, when mm. 
one was uh, Discovered Q Basic, so I, I did some really, really simple games in that, sort of remakes of um, games like um, Taipan. Uh, then after that, I um, I got a copy of uh, Click and Play, which was a really early um, Windows 3.1 game development system uh, made by um, Francis Lionette, who uh, famously made Amos for the Amiga. And I remember that- him uh, talking about that, actually, Click and Play. It was it was like a really kind of simple interface, wasn't it? Mm, absolutely. And it's um, it's been a big influence on the Scorpion engine as well, because a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of the interface and a lot of the general ideas come from come from click and play, and from that um, general experience of using a game maker tool that was actually as fun to make the games as it is to play the games. I've tried to um, bring that experience across to the Scorpion engine. And what kind of things were you doing in click and play? Then? I mean, were you making games yourself at home then at that stage? I was basically just making games for uh, myself also for my brother to play they were never really that advanced uh, i didn't have any access to the internet at the time and i wouldn't for a, a few years after that so i wasn't uploading them anywhere i couldn't download any sort of art assets or anything i was just uh using whatever art i had on hand I even used some art from um corel draws clip art library um for the games and other than that i just sort of use the built-in click-and-play art or um, really roughly hacked up my own art. Were you aware of any of the uh, kind of C64 um, game creators as well, like uh, shoot 'em up construction kit and stuff like that? I didn't have that one in particular on Commodore 64 when I was a kid. I know I had some games where you could customize certain things about the game. Like I had the, the racing destruction kit, I had the, I think it was the pinball creation kit and the the boulder dash creation kit, but I didn't really have anything where you could make an entirely new game from scratch. Well, you kind of grew up in New Zealand, and uh, what what was the computer scene like there? And were you aware of the Amiga? So I grew up in a lot of um, really rural, really remote places in New Zealand. So often there wasn't that much of a community around around computers uh, there were a few computer clubs that I, I went to as a kid but those were often quite far from where i lived so you know we'd take the trip into town to go to it the amiga i was aware um aware of through amiga power magazine which was the only the only magazine i could recall that was um amiga focus we maybe got some of the others in new zealand but i I can only remember Amiga Power, and that was the one I would collect. The thing was, we uh, we were always planning to upgrade the Commodore 64 to an Amiga eventually. And so mm. I would collect these Amiga magazines, and that would build up a library of uh, cover discs so that when we eventually got an Amiga, I would have a you know reasonably extensive library of um, game demos that I could play. Uh, unfortunately, we never actually got an Amiga when I was a kid. When we finally got around to upgrading the Commodore 64, it was sort of around the time that uh, Commodore had gone bankrupt and uh, Doom was just about to come out. And so all of the signs were was that the Amiga was dying and the PC was um, the platform that was going to survive. So that's um, that's the computer we got. Uh, but I never forgot about the Amiga, of course. I, I you know, because I never had one as a kid, I always still wanted one. So when I was an adult, I got a CD32. Well, I basically said to myself, okay, I've got this. What can I do with it? Uh, and I discovered that there were CD32 collections out there of, you know, up to 888 games. I was just sort of mind blown that this console, you could download discs from the internet and play hundreds of different games. But the problem was a lot of them, they either didn't work or they didn't have mouse support, they didn't have keyboard support. So that's why I started making my own compilations of games. The CD32 is quite an interesting model to choose as well, as you know, it definitely wasn't the most popular Amiga. Mm. Um, why did you choose that instead of Absolutely. like an A500 or something? Well, I mean, I um, I actually had a friend that, um, when I, uh, a friend from the Amiga that was in the Amiga scene back in the day, and when I told him that I'd bought a CD32, he said I should have just bought an A1200. Hmm. Um, I didn't actually know th- pretty much anything at all about Amigas when I I got the CD32. I figured that 
since it was a beginner, it was probably best if I bought something where I could just put games in and play them rather than something where, you know, I would need to rely on floppy disks. I would need to, uh, you know, potentially work out how Workbench worked and uh, install games through there. I mean, I think the, um, the, the CD32 is a really fun um, uh, hobby development platform. Um, it's how I got my start with basically everything Amiga development is burning projects onto CD and then putting them on the CD32 to play them. Did you uh, check out any of the demos at all and like the demo scene and uh, kind of get impressed by that? Because I, I know you could run some of them on the uh, CD32. Yeah, um, I almost completely missed out on the demo scene um, when I was a kid because we just sort of didn't have access to anything where you could um, where you could download demos or play them the, the one exposure i had to demo scene as a kid was we had a copy of i think it was called commodore force magazine yeah it, it did have a couple of demos on them and uh there was one that really impressed me called terminus which was it was basically an adaptation of the first couple of minutes of the movie um dark star but now that um now that i know a bit more about the amiga now that um i've been a bit more exposed to the demo scene i did download a few of the demos to put on different collections and uh yeah i think there's um one or two i really like like um i think state of the art is probably the one that stands out yeah they were always the most talented programmers back in the day i think the demo scene code is weren't they that could really push the hardware well even today um uh, yeah every, every now and then you see something mind blowing from the the demo scene yeah how did they do that mm. <laughs> well i mean you're talking about programming how did you get started you know in making amiga games and what tools were you initially using them when you started programming the machine on amiga i've always primarily been a blitz basic user i've done a little bit in c and i've done a little bit in assembly language the reason why i went for blitz basic in particular is even on the pc i was a Blitz Basic developer. So after I finished using Click and Play, I migrated to a few other different game development tools. But the one that I stuck with for a long time was one called Blitz Basic 3D. And then from that, I switched to several other um, Blitz Basic variants, including ones for ones that let you make games for Mac and for Linux. Then eventually, when I decided, okay, well, I want to make some games for Amiga now. Blitz Basic was a logical choice since I'd already become quite familiar with uh, the general syntax of the language. My kind of uh, understanding of Blitz Basic was that you could also put assembly code in there, and uh, that would like speed it up at certain points and stuff. Um, am I am I correct there? Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So you can basically inline assembly language anywhere in a Blitz Basic program. I think most Blitz Basic programs do use assembly language here and there for different functions, like in uh, Super Skid Marks, for example. I'm aware that the calculation that works out the height of any terrain tile is purely assembly language. And that is is I, that what kind of gave it the edge over Amos? Do you think having that um, assembly connection? To be honest, I'm not totally sure. I think. Um, that could be part of it, uh, being able to inline assembly quite easily. I think there might be a few other things, just differences in the way that um, objects are blitted to screen. I think there could be some differences in, like, for example, Amos games seem to be system friendly uh, or multitasking friendly, whereas Blitz Basic games generally aren't. With Blitz Basic games, you generally turn off the multitasking and put it into mode for running games so i'm not totally sure of all the differences between um performance in amos and performance in blitz basic but i, th I think blitz basic was designed with uh 50 hertz games in mind so because of that they designed it to be as fast as they uh fast as it possibly could be we know when you got into the Amiga scene, um, were you surprised at how active it is? Because I know I've seen you hanging out on communities like the English Amiga board, and obviously, you know, you've, you've done a lot of projects since you got into the Amiga, but were you surprised that there was still this big community around a machine that, you know, the rest of the world probably regarded as, you know, dead for two decades? Uh, absolutely. And I, I think what I found more surprising was um, just over time, 
the interest has been going up and up and up rather than down and down and down. So yeah, I think every year we're seeing more and more games. We're sort of seeing more and more new hardware projects like uh, the Vampire and the Terrible Fire. And, we're, and, you know, of course, recently we got the Amiga Mini. So, yeah, it, it seems to be um, the longer time goes on, the, the more and more interest there seems to be in the Amiga. Why do you think that is then? Well, personally, I think it's, well, I, I suppose there's a few factors. Like um, it was a computer a, a lot of people grew up with. Um, but I think more than that was so far ahead of its time and um, just what it could do as a, as a multimedia computer. It had a really good chipset for sound, a really good chipset for graphics, and it wasn't that expensive. So, well, com- uh, compared to some other options at the time, it wasn't that expensive. So I think that um, that meant that it was, you know, because it was so far ahead of its time, it sort of left a lasting impression. So um, I was I was wondering, like, why do you think some of the ports then for the Amiga games were some of them were a bit lesser and uh you know some of them were a bit rushed and stuff like that uh why do you think that happened when it was such a good powerful kind of system i think it ultimately comes down to um not being able to pay programmers for and well programmers and artists uh for a long extended period of time to be able to make really well polished uh triple a games so so one thing is uh, a lot of like especially early Amigas, a lot of games were just straight Atari ST ports. So they didn't take advantage of basically any of the Amigas um uh blitter capability, sprite capability. But also I think even games that were sort of natively coded for Amiga, like um uh, I think Final Fight is probably a good example. They had some uh real talent creating it, it's just they weren't given long enough and they weren't given the support they needed to make um, a port as good as they could have done and I think um, what we're seeing today with um, for example Metro Siege so Metro Siege is an example of what you, what quality you can get when you've got a lot more time to put into a project yeah and I guess some of the ports would be like you know, the assets, they wouldn't even match them to the palette and stuff like that. They'd get them it, and uh, just mm, shove them on. That was one of the issues with some Atari ST ports. So the Atari ST, you've got a base palette of um, 512 colors compared to the Amiga has a base palette of um, 4,096 colors. So for one thing, the, the colors aren't quite as varied, aren't quite as vibrant on um on a native ST game compared to a native Amiga game. But more than that, because the palette values, like the the value in memory is doubled on an Amiga, what you had is you had some games ported where they didn't double the color values, which meant the games when you run on Amiga, they're only half as bright as they were on the ST. Well, I know you've been trying to do something about these games that were, you know, badly ported to the Amiga and maybe were a little bit feature incomplete because you started making special editions of these games that are essentially mods and hacks and improvements of old titles. So tell us a bit about some of these and kind of where that idea came from. Well, um, I think it, it basically came... Well, the, the reason why I started doing them is because... I was doing all of these CD32 releases, and for some games, I thought, "Oh, it might be nice if we if we change it up a bit, so that it's um, you know either a bit more polished or it has some features that the original game doesn't have." And a lot of them were just things that I did just because I was yeah uh, I had some interest in the game, and um, I either saw a way to improve it or I saw a way to put uh, uh, put new levels in the game. or uh, So, for example, um, one of the projects I did was something I called Another World, The Lost Level, which basically takes the exclusive, the PC-exclusive levels from Another World and then puts them in the Amiga engine again so you can play them on any Amiga. One project I did uh, was called the joanna sisters special edition and that was um just i was working on a cd compilation of 
Joanna Sisters related games, and I thought it might be quite cool if um, you know if we can in- improve the art a bit because the art on the Amiga version is basically the same as the Commodore 64 version, more or less. I started digging around and I found that the art of the Nintendo DS version, for the most part, is the same resolution as the art for the Amiga version. So I started experimenting with bringing the art assets across. Then I I got a message from John Shakiris, who works on a lot of different projects. So he's working on Metro Siege. Um, He made Worthy with Alpine 9000. He got in touch and said um, basically that he likes what I'm doing. Since he's an artist, he could do a much better job with converting the the art assets from the Nintendo DS source files to the Amiga. And so he showed me what he did. And yep, it, it definitely was um, miles ahead of what I was doing. He also added a lot of um, like art basically created from scratch. And so uh, because of his help with Joanna Sisters SE, we were able to make something that looked visually a lot closer to the Nintendo DS version of the game. Uh, another one that I saw that you uh, ported, which it must be awesome coming from New Zealand, uh, was uh, a Kiwi's Tale as well, which was a kind of a uh, follow-on of a uh, New Zealand story. Um, mm. uh, how did you go about that? That project dates all the way back to um, 2008. I was working with some local game developers on a project where we would have to enter a game for the retroremakes.com uh, remake competition. There was one category called uh, sequels that weren't. So you had to make a fictional sequel to a real game. One thing I suggested was, well, if we if we took the New Zealand story and then you know remade it, except making it as a team of New Zealanders rather than you know the original team being from Japan. So that's basically what we did, and that originally was um, for PC and Mac. I later ported it again to a different version of Blitz Basic called Monkey, where then I could put it as an HTML5 game on the web. And then years after that, I was starting to learn Blitz Basic, and I thought, well, we could bring this game to Amiga as well. So I took the source code from the Blitz Basic PC version and then ported it bit by bit to Blitz Basic on Amiga until I was able to... um, uh, get the whole game running. I did have to make some compromises here and there. So, for example, the original PC version had uh, high resolution. So on Amiga, you have a much smaller viewport. Uh, but other than that, uh, we were able to um, translate the original game pretty closely. Well, one game that I was um, not only extremely surprised, but actually very pleased to see that you improved, um, was actually my... Christmas present in 1995 when I woke up to uh, a copy of Rise of the Robots from my parents that morning that I was so hyped for that game and I think still in all my gaming memory the biggest disappointment I ever had. You actually tackled that game and improved Rise of the Robots. I've got to ask why that game and how did you improve on it? Well, um, I, I think there are a few reasons why I chose that particular game. One was... I mean, it's it's a fascinating game. It's just a game that, you know, it looked so far ahead of its time, but gameplay-wise, it was uh, completely lacking. So one of the biggest um, uh, hype letdowns. Uh, also, because, like, I actually have done a few special editions of games that weren't really that good to begin with, like um, uh, Total Carnage was another one. And the reason for that is because... You know, it's it's much easier to improve a game that has, well, it's much easier to improve a bad game that has clear defects than it is to improve a game that's already a masterpiece. Yeah, I, I guess it was just sort of an opportunity to experiment with a few things. So, so I did a few tweaks to the gameplay to just where I could to make it more balanced and add a couple of options where I could, but also I was able to change some of the backgrounds so one of the backgrounds i uh, ripped from the arcade version of the game a different background i ripped from the sequel from um, rise of the robots 2 
uh, yeah, so it was just the project I wanted to do because, like, e- even today, um, uh, Rise of the Robots fascinates me. Uh, I wanted to do the best version I could for me, which still isn't really good, to be honest, but it's better than what it was. <laughs> yeah, you could hardly make it worse. Yeah, pretty much. So, so do you think, like, looking over the CD32 games and stuff, if it had not been rushed and stuff and had a bit of a longer shelf life, do you think it would have been a more popular system? Well, yeah, it didn't really have a shortage of games, but of course, just about every game released on it was a game that you could already buy and play on the Amiga 500. I think that hardware-wise, it was just not up to standard. Like, the hardware was... Uh, like, if we're being honest, the hardware wasn't really fundamentally different to the Mega Drive or the Super Nintendo, which had been out for years. And the CD32 was released around the same time as the Jaguar and the 3DO. Um, so I remember seeing in a CD32 magazine, there was an advertisement for Wing Commander 3 on the 3DO, where at the same time, the CD32 only had the first Wing Commander, and even that, it ran pretty slow on the console. So I think that the CD32 itself was never really going to be a success. Maybe if Commodore had lasted a bit longer and they were able to release their follow-up, the they'd apparently planned to do a CD64, which would have been a major improvement in the hardware that could have possibly done a lot better, but even then they would need software support from uh, established developers. And I think um, I think quite quickly a lot of the the AAA Amiga developers had jumped ship to to the PlayStation. Yeah, definitely. Like um what what is your favorite kind of C D thirty two release then out of the catalogue? And uh, did you have any experience with uh, C D XL? Uh, the kind of um, CD32 video format. Yeah, so CDXL is something that um, it was one of the first things I learned about when I was when I started making CD unofficial CD32 compilations. Uh, one of the very first projects we did is we took uh, Canon fodder, which had a uh, FMV intro anyway, but only if you have the MPEG plugin or the MPEG card, which most people didn't have. So what what we did is we took that video and we converted it to CDXL so that anyone with the CD32 could play this version of Cannon Fodder that had the FMV intro. Uh, so far as games actually released on the CD32, I think I, I do have a few um, favorites. Uh, one is Gloom. So that's the first-person shooter that... Um, uh, was made here in New Zealand by Acid Software. That was uh, sorry. That, that's sorry. Black Black Magic, um, which was yeah. the same people but under a different label. And yeah, so I think that's um, that was quite a uh, fun, quirky game. I mean, it's very clearly riffing on Doom, but at the same time, it's not trying to copy it too closely. It's almost like a three D version of something like um, Chaos Engine rather than uh, a direct copy of Doom. It's a fun game to play as well, especially mm. when you put it in. I think it's messy mode. <laughs> like, it's oh, just yeah. like all the, the the limbs of all the zombies and monsters just stay on the floor around you. Yeah, yeah. I think you <laughs> generally need something a little bit more powerful than a stock CD32 for for that mode. Because, yeah. It, it goes, yeah, I mean, so the CD32 struggles a bit with that game um even though you know it's quite low resolution to uh, so that it could run on uh, unexpanded amigas other consoles at the time like just about every other console at the time had a had a port of doom like even the mega drive with the 32x had a port of doom super nintendo had a port of doom the cd32 never had a never had an official port of doom and even even now when people are making unofficial ports to the console Ports of Doom need an upgraded CD32 with additional fast RAM just to play it, let alone mm. play it well. Yeah, it wasn't really designed for that kind of game, I guess, was it? No, so I think um, mm. I, I think that is one of the reasons for 
why the CD32 never really succeeded is because the hardware was really just designed for making game, well, for running games that had always been played on the Amiga. I found that it was really good as a platform for making FMV games. So one of the projects I did was a port of a couple of FMV games, a Time Gal and Road Avenger, and compared to the the Mega CD versions of the games, the, the ports we did had a lot more color because they were in ham mode. They were, you know, they looked very similar to the original uh, arcade machines compared to the Mega Drive version, which was something like, you know, just reduced down to 16 colors. The CD32 didn't actually get many of those FMB games. All of those FMB games, um, they just seemed to make them for the Mega CD. I know it's um, obviously improving a lot of these classic games on these, you know, CD32 ports that you've been doing. You've released those, you know, people can download them for free, and I'll obviously link up um, your your site in the show notes as well. But actually, you've been making commercial games on the Amiga over recent years as well. I mean, how's that kind of gone? And is there still a market there then who actually, you know, are willing to pay for games? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't yet finished any of my own games commercial game releases for Amiga. Mm. The main one I've been working on is Elasity, and for various reasons, that's taken uh, quite a long time. We did release a few demo, free demos of that years and years ago, but the engine that I developed for it at the time, it wasn't very flexible. So even though we'd made some demos that worked and they were quite fun, it was going to become really hard to add things like more levels, more more enemies, more bosses. So that sort of cooled off for a bit. But other other people that I work with, like um, uh, John Shakiris, have made commercial games. So he notably made Worthy, and that I have no idea what the actual sales figures were, but I believe that was a major success for him, and I believe that he's still uh, getting sales today. And like with the release of the Amiga 500 Mini, uh, we've done a um, uh, we did some experiments on getting Worthy to work on the A500 Mini because people were buying Worthy so they would have a new game to play on their Mini. You decided to kind of work on the scorpion engine and uh it's it's really revolutionized amiga development is it is it just you working on it or do you have like a team for music and graphics and uh what, what why did you decide that this engine was needed well um so far as the programming goes um i've done all of the the development on it so that uh so the, the two major components of that are the game engine that runs on amiga and the editor for the game engine, which um, currently only exists for Windows. Uh, so far as the uh, graphics and sound, it's mostly been other people that have done the graphics and sound that have gone into the sample games. Where possible, I've used uh, art from places like Open Game Art and um, sound from uh, royalty-free uh, sound libraries. Also, uh, there's a musician named JMD who's done, uh, who does a lot of sa- uh, songs for different Amiga games, and he's provided uh, a few songs for Scorpion Engine sample games. The reason why we created the Scorpion Engine is uh, John Ch- uh, Chakiris got in touch with me and said um, uh, Patrick Nevian is making a new game in his tales of uh gorlith series and those games are all all made with the backbone engine um he asked if we could uh possibly look at making sort of a a blitz basic version so i started playing around with making a generic engine for making games it's um and i did things like i worked on a an importer so that you could you could take a backbone game and then you could convert all of the assets and be able to run it faster in uh, in this new engine. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we never got around to finishing the um, the Tales of Gorloth port. And the reason for this is 
the because the Scorpion engine is being upgraded all the time, eventually we'll get to the point where we say, okay, yep, the engine is good enough to do everything we want to do for for the port. But yeah, so that, that's where it got it, where it got its start is a, just a system for being able to make faster and more feature rich versions of Backbone games. Then over time, it got to the point where you could make a game you know entirely original game in it and just yeah every few months there's a few new major features so just recently uh we've been adding some more support for um aga tricks for uh parallax where you can have like three layers of parallax that are all independently scrolling one thing i like about it as well is a lot of the games that i've seen made where they actually target like you know the amiga 500 you know the, the unexpanded machines because a lot of amiga games that have come out in the last decade need expensive CPU accelerators and loads of extra memory, you know, stuff that we didn't have back in the day. But there seems to be a bit of an aim with Scorpion for it to, to run on, you know, standard Amiga hardware a lot of the time. Well, that is one of the the core principles of the engine is that it should run with comparable performance to commercial games that were released back in the day. Otherwise, you know, there's, there's not really... Uh, any point to it if you know if, if you've got a game making tool but then the games won't run on a typical Amiga there's there's no real point to it but having said that there like I found that there's generally two types of um, Scorpion engine developers so there are ones that are very keen on targeting the Amiga 500 so everything they do is targeted towards that they make sure to make good use of sprites they make sure to keep the palette limited to 16 colors if they can um, they make sure that there's not too many things on screen all at once and then on the other side you've got people who want to make the best game they possibly can want to make the um the best looking the flashiest game they can and so those people would generally target Amiga 1200 with a few megs of fast RAM uh, because mm. I found that even when you're really pushing Scorpion with having a lot of things on screen, if you've got an Amiga 1200 with uh, fast RAM, that will normally run it. You don't normally need like an 030 or an 060 to get full frame rate on even the most demanding Scorpion engine games. With the Scorpion engine, uh, are there a lot of kind of PC tools that help with development and help kind of speed it up rather than just creating it within uh, an Amiga environment? I mean, the Amiga engine is written with Blitz Basic. I do most of my development in a an IDE called Atom, which is a PC application. A member of the Amiga community made a plugin so for it so that you get nice um, formatting for Blitz Basic files. So you can open a Blitz Basic file and then you know, everything is nicely laid out. And that, that's a much nicer environment than you know, developing within WinUEE, within the original Blitz Basic um, editors from the 90s. That's a tool that I use for developing the Amiga side of the engine for the PC editor side, um, the, the software that you can actually use to make and edit a Scorpion game, that is all developed in Unity uh, because Unity is what I use in my day job. Um, but also, it is quite a nice system for making pretty much anything with graphics. So it, it, um, it suits my needs um, for uh, creating the editor suite. So I assume like uh, the Scorpion engine kind of takes advantage of the 68K. Um, do, do you think that it will be able to be ported to other systems? And is that uh, something you're aiming on doing? Long term, yes. That That is a goal of the Scorpion engine project. It might be some time away before I manage to get native uh, ports out to other systems. Uh, as you say, it uses the 68k and so at least in theory there's a fair bit of it that would run on other 68k platforms so the mega drive the jaguar the neo geo but at at the moment it's something that 
I haven't put aside any time to start looking into, you know, how do I get this to run on these other platforms like the Mega Drive. It is one of my Patreon stretch goals, but it might be a long time before I get, get anywhere close to um, close to that goal. I, I, my ultimate dream would be a kind of engine that you could, you know, develop one game and then uh, cross compile it and have it going out to all these different platforms. I, th- I think that would be really awesome. Mm. Let everybody know what your uh, patron is as well. Oh, uh, so it's just um, patreon.com slash scorpion engine. So scorpion engine is just one word. I was just going to say that, um, so we have some limited export and scorpion for other platforms at the moment. So we do have a one-click Windows export, which is really just an emulation wrapper. Um, but it means an, it means that if you really want to do a Windows release of your game, you can do this uh, export, and then you've got a folder with the emulator all configured with your game already. The other thing that I was going to say, and this is something that a, um, a fellow member of the Amiga community mentioned to me, is that if we ever do get Mega Drive, well, especially Mega Drive support, but also other platforms as well, if we do get Mega Drive support in Scorpion Engine, it would actually be really good for the Amiga community as well, because there would be a lot of people out there that would be interested in making a Mega Drive game, and if they if they make a Mega Drive game, and then they say, okay, well to get this game on Amiga, to get a few more sales from the Amiga community, it would only just, um, it wouldn't be that hard to do because I've already written it for Scorp- uh, in Scorpion for Mega Drive. Then that means that we would get, the Amiga community would get these uh, new Mega Drive games as well. It's a really yeah, uh, very cool. smart way of going about things, that is actually. Well, I mean, earlier on, you touched on the, the A500 Mini, and obviously yep. it's been getting a lot of attention. You know, it, it's amazing that you can now walk into uh, a store in a shopping mall and pick up an Amiga again, you know, in, mm. in 2022. Do you see potential there then? And do you think that'll bring in a new audience? And have you got any plans to kind of aim, aim games at them? Well, for me, it was actually the first time I've been able to buy a brand new Amiga off the shelf and take it home before yeah. uh, all of my other Amigas have been second hand. In Scorpion Engine, we do have an export button. Uh, so the Amiga 500 Mini is based on a Raspberry Pi distribution um, called Amiberry. So because of that, oh, and because they on the Mini they added uh, USB key support, what we did in Scorpion is we made it so you can push a button and then it exports a, an Amiga 500 Mini package with some instructions on you know, how you actually get it on the device. Um, so far as bringing new members into the community, I'm not totally sure how much of a splash it's going to have outside of people that weren't already fans of the Amiga. I know that um, some people, well, I, I believe that uh, for a few other people other than me, this is their first Amiga and so people have been buying games for Amiga to run on the Mini. I have found that the emulation isn't quite as good as I would like it to be. Like some games do struggle a bit when they have complicated backgrounds. Uh, games like uh, Jim Power and Lionheart. That's hopefully something that they can fix with um, firmware updates. But yeah, I think um, I know there's a lot of controversy in the community about, you know, is this really an Amiga or not, or is this uh, just a toy? But I think in either case, it is um, it is quite exciting that we're getting um, new hardware um, uh, for the Amiga, as you say, in 2022. Well, Iraq, I mean, it's been amazing hearing, you know, not only about your, your CD32 ports and you know your your um, improvements on these classic Amiga games and uh, obviously the work on the Scorpion engine is just uh, taking the scene by storm at the moment. I mean, obviously I'll link up your patron in our show notes. You know, if people want to support your incredible work, um, just repeat it for us again. What's your address for your Patreon? So it's patreon.com slash Scorpion Engine. Um, a Scorpion Engine is one word. Great. Well, I'll put that in our show notes as well so people can follow that. Is there anything we should... Um, look out for from you that's coming up soon then any more special editions or you continue in the cd32 ports hadn't really planned to unfortunately um the scorpion engine basically takes up all my free um uh free development time 
you know, you never know. Um, at some point, I might um, I might put another CD32 uh, project out there. At some point, I do want to add a CD32 export button to Scorpion Engine, which means that people will uh, it'll be easier for Scorpion Engine developers to put their games onto CD32. Well, it is nice to see the CD32 getting a bit of love again from people. So uh, that's much appreciated. Well, listen, it's been so interesting talking to you. So thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing some of your memories with us and uh, telling us about the incredible work that you're doing and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, It was a pleasure to be here. 